all of these. I'm only give, going to give you one example, but we can discuss the other examples later on. In the early stages, until around 1950, almost everything we learned about the human brain and about mental function came from studies of patients with one or another disorder and from studies of experimental animals. But a major revolution occurred about 20 years ago that made it possible to study people like you and me, intact behaving subjects awake, responding to certain tasks, looking at objects, examining objects, and this was through imaging experiments. With, for example, with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, a normal person, this is absolutely painless, can lie in a scanner, and when it, they do a particular task, that area becomes active, it fires action potentials, it becomes more active. That requires more energy, there's an increased blood flow, there's an increased oxygen, and that signal is taken by the scanner and is able to indicate what area of the brain becomes active when there's an increased oxygen demand in that region that is being recruited. And Nancy Canrish, whose image I show here, was one of the pioneers in this area, and she was the first person to define a specific area that responded selectively to faces. We now know from her work and from Marge Livingston's work that there are several areas that respond to faces and process different aspects of faces. In the monkey, you can see similar areas. You can see it but with, vision, with imaging. You put an electrode into any one of these areas, 95 to 97% of the cells respond to faces brrr, like that if they look at Tom Cech's face. They respond to nothing else but faces. They will not respond to places, to any other objects, selectively to faces. So before I go on to take up the issue of can memory be localized, let me stop here for a few questions. Yes? Um, with the brain, did you find that like more basic functions were like deeper in the brain or something? Like the like more human functions were towards the outside and the basic That's ones were more centered? A wonderful question. This is true. I mean, the fact is that the cerebral cortex is a later development in evolution. I mean, even in the mammalian brain, uh, mice and rats have a cerebral cortex, but it's not as elaborate, particularly the front part of the cortex is not as elaborate. What is conserved, even among very simple animals, you know, vertebrates, for example, that don't have a developed cerebral cortex, is that their instincts, their, their basic drives are there, the, the drive for food, for mates, for safety, those are all things that are quite deep in the brain and they're conserved throughout evolution. They then become modulated by higher cortical processes, but the basic capability is there. These are wonderful questions. Yes, I'm sorry, the two of you. First, the y young lady behind you and then you in the red shirt. Uh, is there a significance in the size of a brain, for example, a human who's considered to be very intelligent versus a dolphin, for example? Uh, the dolphin brain actually, I think, is slightly larger than the human brain. There's not a simple correlation between a, a species as to whether or not a larger brain guarantees the fact that you will be more intelligent. Um, as far as we know, the human brain, by the criteria we set, which are anthropomorphic criteria, uh, you know, we handle the functions that we're involved in better than any other experimental animals. Can we fly? Can we swim as well as a dolphin? Can we fly as well as a dolphin? No. So they have certain skills that we don't have. Yes? You said earlier that Broca's area and Wernicke's area control all languages, correct? Or are responsible for all languages. How does the brain organize, like in a bilingual, for example? Is there any difference in like... This is a wonderful, wonderful question. And I'm going to return to this in my last lecture. As you probably know, the capability to acquire a foreign language is greatest in the early years of life. So after puberty, uh, it's possible to acquire a foreign language, but you never get a, a perfect accent. Uh, if you acquire the language early, let's say simultaneously, it is in a, both languages that you acquire if you're bilingual, are represented in the same Broca's area, just intermixed. If you acquire the foreign language somewhat later, it becomes an attached area to Broca's area, an independent area. Uh, Judy Hirsch at Columbia was the one who, who showed that. Thank you very much. Those were very, very good questions. Let me then go on 
and consider with you uh, the issue of memory. So by the middle of the 20th century, even before imaging, one had a fair amount of confidence that many mental functions could be localized to specific regions in the, in the brain. And that raised the question, where in the brain is memory stored? Many people thought that memory is not like vision, uh, hearing, uh, even like language. It's such a diffuse mental process uh, that is usually connected to motor skills, it's usually connected to perceptual skills of various kinds, that is likely to be very diffuse. And in fact, Carl Lashley, professor at Harvard, supported this notion. Uh, he ran a series of experiments that showed that memory is a diffuse property of the cerebral cortex. <clears throat> and the experiments were of this sort. He would run a rat through a maze that had a lot of blind alleys to get to a goal where the animal was given a food reward. And with a number of trials, it ran this very rapidly and very successfully. He then began to remove small pieces of the cerebral cortex. And he found that small lesions had no effect, irrespective of where he took the lesion from. So there was no region that seemed to be specialized for maze learning tasks. Only when he began to take large parts of the brain, and again, irrespective of where he took it from, did he interfere with his task. So small lesions had no effect whatsoever. Large lesions had an effect. This caused him to argue that memory could not be localized to any part of the cerebral cortex. People were skeptical. They thought there were some weaknesses to his experiments. And there were two aspects of it that were particularly focused in on. One is he focused only on the cerebral cortex. We know there are a lot of structures that came out in the questions deep in the brain. Maybe some of those structures are involved in learning and memory, number one. Number two, rats are very smart. And they can use a number of different strategies for learning a maze. So if you deprive them of their vision, they'll use tactile cues. They'll use their sense of smell. They'll use other strategies in order to get there. So using a maze is not such a terrific task if you want to focus in on specific uh, location of memory. The person who helped us the most in understanding uh, memory research was Wilder Penfield, another giant uh, in bringing psychology uh, and brain sciences together. Penfield ultimately went to the Montreal Neurological Institute and developed an institute concerned with the cerebral cortex in people. He was a brilliant neurosurgeon, and he focused in on a particular kind of epilepsy, a cortical epilepsy, due to scar tissue in the cerebral cortex. Uh, when people are in severe accidents, when they have a severe brain concussion, for example, automobile accident, a football game, a bicycle accident, they not infrequently are left with a concussion that causes, that leaves them with a scar on one or another part of the brain. That scar can give rise to seizure activity, and that seizure activity sometimes can be controlled with medicine, but sometimes not, in which case you have to excise it. And Penfield was the first person to develop systematic ways of excising this. He realized that the brain has no pain receptors. So if you infiltrate the scalp with the local anesthetic, you could uh, expose the scalp, you could open up the scalp, open up uh, the skull, expose the brain, and have an intact, behaving patient who could talk back to you as you stimulated his brain. And you could stimulate Wernicke's area and Broca's area, make sure you don't damage any of those areas in the process of doing this operation. And he found that when he stimulated certain parts of the brain, that he got certain predictable results. So for example, when he stimulated a part of uh, the somatosensory area, he got a transient response of, of tactile sensation. Patient would describe tingling in the thumb, for example. If he moved the electrode to the motor cortex, he could get protrusion of the tongue or, or other kinds of motor movements. But when he suddenly found, when he stimulated the temporal cortex, that he didn't simply get a transient response, he got a full-blown memory. People recalled earlier experience in the most marvelous way. One patient recalled, this particular patient, hearing orchestral music. He heard a song that he loved from his high school days. It was so real and vivid to him that he was sure that Penfield had turned on a phonograph, because otherwise he wouldn't hear it that clearly. The first patient 
that Penfield ever operated on was 